In the early 1950s, as new high-speed, high-ceiling strategic bombers entered service, fighter aircraft's armament of machine guns, cannons, and unguided rockets proved inadequate to stop them, while air-to-air -air guided missiles were still in their infancy. Because intercontinental ballistic missiles had not yet been developed, the interception of Soviet strategic bombers was a major military preoccupation in the USA at the time. But how to ensure the destruction of an armada of Soviet bombers? The solution was found in 1954, when Douglas Aircraft began to develop a simple and reliable unguided rocket, since its large blast radius made precise accuracy unnecessary. This could be achieved only by using a nuclear warhead. Thus, a new air-to-air -air rocket with the designation MB-1 Genie was developed. The device was powered by a solid-fuel rocket engine of 162 kilonewtons thrust, sufficient to accelerate the rocket to 1,100 meters per second to cover up to 9,700 meters. At the same time, a 1.7 kiloton W-25 nuclear warhead was specially designed for this device by the Los Alamos National Laboratory. This was the first U.S. sealed pit device, which means that the fission material was contained in a hermetically sealed metal case to prevent it from the hazardous environment and reduce the risk of radioactive contamination should the device be exposed to a fire or a small detonation. Detonation of the warhead was by time delay fuse, although the fusing mechanism would not arm the warhead until engine burnout to give the launch aircraft sufficient time to turn and escape. The rocket had a lot of advantages. First, its total flight time was about 10 seconds, leaving no time for an enemy plane to fire back. Second, its W-25 warhead was powerful enough to destroy an enemy plane within about 300 meters and inflict serious damage to any objects beyond this radius. Third, the rocket was not equipped with complex electronics so it wasn't vulnerable to electronic warfare systems or the EMP of a nuclear blast. If it came to a real conflict, Genie rockets would have played a significant role in protecting the country from an air attack. However, maintaining and using the new weapon were relatively difficult. It also presented some danger for the launching aircraft. In 1956, Dwight Eisenhower signed the Authorization for the Expenditure of Atomic Weapons in Air Defense. It gave the military advance authority to use nuclear weapons in some instances when defending the United States against aerial attack. Continental Air Defense Command's Chief, General Earl Partridge, accidentally revealed the existence of the policy in a 1957 interview with U.S. News and World Report. It caused little stir at the time, but the American public had already begun to realize the damage of nuclear fallout caused by atmospheric tests. So to avoid potential fears of the new nuclear air defense weapons deployed throughout the country and their possible use, the Air Force was eager to demonstrate that nuclear air defense arms would not endanger those on the ground. They argued that the weapons were of sufficiently small kilotonnage and would be used at high altitudes. Thus, the service arranged with the Atomic Energy Commission to test fire a weapon from a specially outfitted fighter during Plumbob, a forthcoming nuclear test series at the Nevada test site. General Earl Partridge instructed Arthur Oldfield, Air Defense Command, ADC, Public Information Officer, to develop the best plan to trumpet Genie's introduction and prove its safe use. Even though the project was secret, the general wanted the weapons out in the open. Five ADC officers heard about this assignment and volunteered to stand beneath the air blast eager to support the public relation effort. They were confident that the theoretical calculations were correct, 
and the rocket would perform as designed. As for the radiation safety, they referred to a high-altitude test performed in 1955, which resulted in little radiation below the blast. Their proposal was eagerly accepted by the command, which facilitated news coverage of the operation by offering media briefings. For the test event, accredited print, radio and television journalists were invited to the proving ground. The filming of the blast at Air Zero was performed by Akira Yoshitake, a photographer from the secret Lookout Mountain Laboratory in California. In the early morning of 19 July 1957, an F-89 Scorpion and interceptor jet piloted by Eric Hutchinson and Alfred Barbie took off from the Indian Springs Air Base accompanied by two other planes and headed for the Yucca Flats portion of the Nevada test site. By that time, the five volunteers and the photographer were already standing on the ground beneath Air Zero. The officer stood next to a hand-lettered sign that read, Ground Zero, Population 5, that Oldfield had fashioned from cardboard. At 7 a.m., the F-89 launched the Genie, then swiftly banked to get away from the lethal area. By the moment of the blast, the plane was more than 3,300 meters away from it. The nuclear rocket flew 4,250 meters in just four and one-half seconds and detonated at 5,640 meters above Nevada with a yield of two kilotons. The resulting gamma and neutron doses received by the crewmen of the three planes were less than three wrenchens. The test was dubbed Shot John. The observers on the ground saw a bright flash and experienced a sudden rush of heat. During the event, Major Norman Bodinger radioed a narration to the operations command center. The acoustic wave arrived in 13 seconds. Because of the high altitude and small yield of the blast, the gamma and neutron doses received by the officers on the ground were negligible. As for the radioactive fallout below Air Zero, it was almost undetectable because the radioactive cloud of fission products didn't suck up any dirt from the ground due to the blast's high altitude. It contained only atmospheric dust, which later dispersed over a large area and then slowly settled. The test was successfully completed. This first test of a nuclear warhead by launching a rocket from a plane provided valuable information about the effects of the blast on the plane and its crew. And the group of five officers who volunteered to stand below the blast proved to American citizens that this nuclear weapon was safe for use over populated areas. While it was in service with the U.S. Air Force since 1958, the Genie rocket was carried operationally on the F-89 Scorpion, F-101 Voodoo, and the F-106 Delta Dart, which played an important role in the air defense of the United States and Canada. About 3,000 Genie rockets were mass-produced before production ended in 1963. They were in service for more than 25 years. Operational use of the Genie was discontinued in 1986 with the retirement of the F-106 Interceptor, the only plane in the inventory at that time that could carry it. Douglas offered an upgrade of the rockets to make other planes Genie capable, but this solution was considered inefficient. Besides, more advanced long-range guided missiles had been developed by this time. So. What actually happened to the volunteers and the photographer who stood under the air zero of the nuclear explosion? In their old age, all of them were diagnosed with cancer. Half of them recovered, and in the end, they all reached an advanced age. John Hughes passed away at the age of 71. Norman Bodinger at 76. Frank Ball at 83. Sidney Bruce at 86, and Donald Luttrell at 91. 
Akira Yoshitake, the photographer, passed away at age 84. It remains unclear whether the cancers were caused by their participation in this unique experiment. In any event, all of them said they didn't regret their participation and were glad to contribute to history.